Thank you, John, your Reverend Fathers, Your Excellencies. Thank you for the privilege of addressing you once again. This topic will be rather controversial, even more so than what I discussed yesterday. And it will occur to some of you as I'm speaking that there's a rather serious accusation involved in what I'm saying. And I'm going to talk about that accusation expressly at the end of this presentation. And I hope to be able to present it in a way that allows us all to approach this without hostility or rancor toward those in authority in the church, but rather with an understanding of how the problem I'm going to discuss today has arisen. I'm here to talk about the third secret of Fatima and recent developments in this controversy. And the controversy is, of course, have we received from Vatican authorities the entirety of the third secret of Fatima? Now, there's a group in the church, and this group over the years has said some things that the great majority of the members of the church either don't know about, don't care about, or regard with skepticism. One of the things this group, and it's a very small group within the church, was saying, for example, over the past 30 years, is that Paul VI had never forbidden the traditional Latin Mass, and that every priest in the church was free to continue saying the traditional Latin Mass. And of course, Pope Benedict XVI has just confirmed that that, in fact, is the case. In his motu proprio, he said that the traditional Latin Missal had never been abrogated. And in his explanatory letter, he said that it was never forbidden and that no permission was ever needed to say the Mass. There was something else this small group said and has been saying over the years. They were saying that the consecration of Russia needs to mention Russia. That you can't consecrate a nation without mentioning it. And from those two examples, I guess you can say that this group has a predilection for stating the obvious. And this group is known by various insulting names that certain people have applied to this group. This group is called the traditionalists. Or they call this group the Fatimists. Or they call them extreme traditionalists or Fatimites or some other insulting name. But the thing about this group is that what it says happens to be true. And that what it says basically, as with the traditional mass not being forbidden, Russia not being consecrated, it's just a statement of the obvious. Well, this group, the traditionalists, the Fatimites, whatever you want to call them, and I'm one of them, has been saying over the years that there's something missing in the Vatican's disclosure in June of 2000, that there must be words spoken by the Blessed Virgin to the Fatima seers which explain the vision of the bishop in white who was killed on a hill outside a ruined city, which the Vatican published in June of 2000 and told us is the entirety of the third secret. No, no, this group said there must be something missing. The Virgin surely had to explain what this ambiguous vision means. How does the Pope come to be killed outside a half-ruined city? Why is the city filled with bodies? Why is the city ruined? What city is it? Who killed all of these people in the city? And who kills the Pope outside the city on the top of a hill? Something must be missing. And it turns out that just as they w were correct about the old mass not being prohibited and Russia not being consecrated, they were correct about this. The case is over. We have an eyewitness, Archbishop Capovilla, 
Loris F. Capovilla, the personal secretary of John XXIII, who has revealed to one of the speakers at this conference, Solideo Paolini, that there are in fact two different envelopes pertaining to the third secret of Fatima and two different texts pertaining to the third secret of Fatima. One envelope contains the vision that we were given on June 26, 2000, and the other envelope contains a text whose contents we have not yet been given. But Archbishop Capovilla has confirmed, and the Vatican has not denied, that there are two envelopes. And one envelope, he says, was always located in the papal apartment in a writing desk of John the 23rd, an antique desk. It's such, a, such an important antique, the desk actually has a name. The desk is called Barbarigo. The archbishop has said that there was a text in an envelope in the writing desk called Barbarigo, and the Vatican does not deny it. So the case is over. We know there's a missing text. Now the question is, what is in this text? What does it contain? Well, the little group of traditionalists and Fatimites and extremists, as they always do, they add up two and two and they arrive at four. And they have come up with a statement of the obvious about what this missing text must contain. And how have they done this? They've just looked at the evidence, because many people have spoken about what's in this envelope in the writing desk called Barbarigo. And many people have revealed, in one way or another, the contents. The first of these was Pope Pius XII, back in 1931, when he was still Monsignor Pacelli, serving as the Secretary of State for Pope Pius XI. And here is what the future Pius XII said in 1931 about the message of Fatima. And I want you to remember this quote as one of the most important pieces of evidence because it's absolutely astonishing that the Pope would say this in 1931. And here is what he said. I am worried by the Blessed Virgin's messages to little Lucia of Fatima. This persistence of Mary about the dangers which menace the church is a divine warning against the suicide of altering the faith in her liturgy, her theology, and her soul. And then the future pope went on to say, I hear all around me innovators who wish to dismantle the sacred chapel, destroy the universal flame of the church, reject her ornaments, and make her feel remorse for her historical past. And then the Pope went on to say this, about what he saw was coming in the church. He said, a day will come when the civilized world will deny its God, when the church will doubt as Peter doubted. She will be tempted to believe that man has become God. In our churches, Christians will search in vain for the red lamp where God awaits them, like Mary Magdalene, weeping before the empty tomb, they will ask, where have they taken him? And that is what Pius XII said about the future of the church only 31 years before Vatican II. And he said this with reference to Sister Lucia's messages that she had received from the Blessed Virgin. 
He said it concerning the message of Fatima. He put the two together. He said the message of Fatima is about a crisis in the church, the suicide of altering the liturgy of the church, the theology of the church, the soul of the church. I have read the original French text of the Pope's statement. I have in my possession the autobiography of the Pope by Monsignor Roche, who recorded that conversation in which the Pope made that statement. There is no doubt he made that statement. And so we know already in 1931 that there's something about the message of Fatima which talks about alterations of the liturgy, changes in theology, changes in the soul of the church, a time when people will go into a parish church and they will not even find a sanctuary lamp. And coming from America, I can tell you there were many, many churches after the Second Vatican Council where you would not find a sanctuary lamp and you would ask, as Pius XII said people would be asking, where have they taken him? Where is the Eucharistic Lord? Now that is a fantastic prophecy and it all came true and the future Pope related it to the message of Fatima. So we know the third secret must contain a reference to changes in the liturgy and the theology of the church and the soul of the church because the first two parts of the secret that we have already known and were known from the 1920s forward say nothing about this. So what, the, what Pope Pius XII was talking about must be contained in a part of the secret that was not yet known to the world in general in 1931, but which, from the evidence, we now know quite clearly. Now, we know that eventually the third secret was taken from the custody of the Bishop of Fatima and that it ended up in the Vatican. And we also know that it ended up in two different places in the Vatican, meaning that there were two different texts. One text ended up in the Holy Office archives. But we also know for certain that another text ended up in the safe of Pope Pius XII, a wooden safe in his papal apartment. And we know this because there were photographs of the safe in Parry Match magazine back in 1957. And the photographer who took those photographs told him that the Pope's personal housekeeper, Sister Pasqualina, had confirmed to him that in that little wooden safe in the papal apartment was a text of the Third Secret of Fatima, different from the text that was in the Holy Office archives. And as I told you at the beginning of this talk, we know that that text ended up in Barbarigo, the wooden desk in the apartment of Pope John XXIII. We also know from the evidence that a series of popes read two different texts of the secret. We know that John the 23rd in 1959 read two different texts. One text, he said, he had no trouble reading without a translation, even though it was in Portuguese, because it had no idiomatic expressions and he knew enough Portuguese to be able to read it. But the other text had a number of idiomatic expressions and he had to have that translated for him. And we know that he read one text, according to the official Vatican account, that was returned to the Holy Office archives. But we also know from Archbishop Capovilla's testimony that another text was returned to Barbarigo, the writing desk in the papal apartment, where it remained until his death. Paul VI read two different texts of the secret. The official Vatican account in 2000 says he read a text of the Third Secret in 1965. What we also know from the testimony of Monsignor Capovilla that Solideo Paolini has uncovered, that there is a document reflecting the fact, and this is in Archbishop Capovilla's files, that Paul VI called for and read a text of the Third Secret of Fatima within days of his election in 1963, two years earlier. The Vatican's official account does not mention this. 
And yet we know it's true because there's a contemporaneous document that the Vatican has not denied reflecting that Paul VI read it in 1963 even before he was officially seated as Pope at the papal coronation mass. That's how quickly Paul VI wanted to read that secret. And we know that John Paul II read two different texts of the Third Secret of Fatima. We know because his spokesman, Joaquin Navarro Valls, revealed in 2000 that John Paul II had read a text of the Third Secret of Fatima in 1978 within days of his election, just the way Paul VI had. But the Vatican tells us in 2000 that John Paul II did not read the Third Secret of Fatima until 1981, three years into his papacy. And I'll ask a question for you to consider right now. Is it reasonable to believe that John Paul II, the Pope of Fatima, the Pope dedicated to the message of Fatima, who said, totus tuus, all yours to Our Lady, would wait three years to read the text of the Third Secret that was available to him from the moment he was elected? if not sooner? Obviously not. And, and the Pope's spokesman revealed that he did, in fact, read it in 1978. Now, what was in this second text? We have abundant testimony from a number of sources that this text must relate to the last spoken words of the Virgin recorded in Sister Lucy's diaries that we knew about before she wrote down the third secret in 1944. And what were those words? In her fourth memoir, she added to the text of the third secret that she had thus far written down these telltale words. She said, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. That is what she wrote in the fourth memoir. She added the etc. to Our Lady's words. Our Lady's words end with, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. Sister Lucy added an etc. So obviously there's a portion of the secret that begins with a prophecy that in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. The logical inference is somewhere else it won't be preserved. Otherwise, why is Our Lady talking about Portugal and dogma? And so every Fatima scholar from that point forward realized that in her fourth memoir, Sister Lucy had given us a key hint about the contents of the third secret of Fatima. And every Fatima scholar was convinced that this was the beginning of the third secret and that the third secret relates to a dogmatic crisis in places outside of Portugal, a dogmatic crisis throughout the church. And as I told you moments before, the future Pius XII predicted that in 1931. And here's what Father Alonso said about this mysterious etc. He was the Fatima archivist. No one had better access to Sister Lucy than he did. He interviewed her many, many times. And here is what he said about this mysterious phrase. And I'm quoting. The phrase most clearly implies a critical state of faith, which other nations will suffer, a crisis of faith, whereas Portugal will preserve its faith. In the period preceding the great triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, terrible things are to happen. If, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, it can clearly be deduced that in other parts of the church, those dogmas are going to become obscure or even lost altogether. Thus, he concludes, it is quite possible that the text makes concrete references 
to the crisis of faith in the church, and to the negligence of the pastors themselves. And this is the, the official Fatima archivist speaking. Not me, not the traditionalists, not the Fatimites, but Father Alonzo back in the 1960s. And so we know from what he said and from what others have said that there is a missing portion of the text about a crisis in the church. And this text must contain words spoken by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Not just a vision of a bishop in white being executed on a hill with the Virgin saying nothing, but words of the Virgin. And those words would explain how the Pope comes to be executed outside a city and the events that led up to that terrible occurrence. And those words probably explain a crisis in the church. And we know that we're talking about words of the Virgin because in 1960, when the Vatican declared to the world that the third secret was not going to be published in 1960, and that's the year that Lucy said the Virgin wished it to be published because it would be clearer in 1960, when the Vatican said it was not going to be published in that year, here is what the Vatican's press release said, February 9, 1960. It has just been stated in very reliable circles of the Vatican to the representatives of United Press International that it is most likely that the letter will never be opened in which Sister Lucia wrote down the words which Our Lady confided as a secret to the three little shepherds in the Cova da Iria. And then the same press release goes on to say that the Vatican, according to whoever wrote this press release, does not pledge herself to guarantee the veracity of the words which the three little shepherds claim to have heard from Our Lady. So twice in the same press release, the Vatican is talking about words of the Virgin, which the visionaries, actually two of them, because Francisco didn't hear, he was later told, words which they heard. Not a vision that they saw, but words that they heard. Vatican itself says that. And witness after witness over the years indicated that we're talking about a text consisting of one page containing words of the Virgin about a crisis in the church. For example, we know that Bishop Venancia, just before the text of the secret went to the Vatican, held up the envelope containing it, and he could see through the envelope a single page, perhaps 20 to 25 lines of text. And we know that Cardinal Ottaviani, in testimony that Archbishop Bertone has conceded, also insisted that the text of the secret that he was talking about consisted of 20 to 25 lines. Now the bishop in white, that vision is contained in four pages and has 62 lines. Already we know that there are two different texts. And we know from other witnesses that it was in the form of a letter. I just read to you the Vatican press release referring to a letter. A letter is addressed to someone, dear so-and-so, and it ends with a closing line that's appropriate to a letter. The vision in the Bishop in White that was published in 2000 is not in letter form. And Sister Lucia told Father Yangan and Father Alonzo that it, the third secret was contained in a letter that she had written to the Bishop of Fatima and placed inside a sealed envelope. We know that letter contains words of the Virgin, not only because of the Vatican press release, but because Cardinal Ottaviani referred to this text as containing, as he put it, what 
the Virgin wanted Sister Lucia to tell the Pope. And we know that this text is a prophecy of future events that was so terrifying that Sister Lucy could not write it down, even when she was ordered to do so by her bishop in 1944. She could not bring herself to put it down on paper. Now remember that the first two parts of the secret refer to the spreading of Russia's errors, the persecution of the church, and the annihilation of nations. She had no trouble writing that down. But this, she could not write down. So it must be something even worse than the spread of world communism, world wars, the persecution of the church, and even worse than the annihilation of nations. And we know from a very important eyewitness that this text contains the continuation of the words of the Virgin indicated by that little etc. I mentioned. We know this because in 1955, Pope Pius XII sent a special emissary to interview Sister Lucia, Father Schweigel, a Jesuit, and that Father Schweigel, after this interview was over, revealed this. He said that there are two parts to the secret. The first part, he said, concerns the Pope. And the second part, he said, although I may say nothing, he said, is, and I'm quoting him, the logical continuation of the words in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. the logical continuation. So here is the Pope's own emissary in 1955 revealing that the text, obviously the text we have not yet seen, is the logical continuation of the words of the Virgin. And we have witness after witness giving hints that this text predicts an apostasy, a loss of faith in the church, and that it begins at the top. I'm not saying it begins with the Pope. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that it begins with high-ranking level, levels of the hierarchy. And we know this because Cardinal Chiappi, the personal theologian to a whole series of popes, said that the third secret concerns a crisis in the faith and that in this prediction there is talk of an apostasy that begins at the top. And we know that it's of an apocalyptic nature because twice in his sermons at Fatima, Pope John Paul II specifically links the message of Fatima to the book of the Apocalypse. And in, in the year 2000, he explicitly speaks of those chapters in the book of the Apocalypse which warn about the tale of the dragon that drags consecrated souls, the stars, from heaven. And that is traditionally interpreted to be a reference to the fall of priests and religious from their consecrated state because of, of corruption and loss of faith. And this is the Pope relating the message of Fatima in the year 2000, the very year we were told we had received the entire third secret, to the book of the Apocalypse and the tale of the dragon, which are not mentioned at all in the first two parts of the secret. So this must be a reference to the third part. And we know from other testimonies, including Cardinal Ratzinger's, in an interview in Jesus Magazine in 1984, that the contents of this text must be sensational. In 1984, he said that the third secret is a, quote, religious prophecy, unquote. And it warns of, quote, dangers threatening the faith and the life of the Christian and therefore of the world. That is what he said in 1984, three years after the assassination attempt. He did not say in 1984 that the secret is all about the assassination attempt. He never mentioned the assassination attempt. He spoke of dangers to the faith, the life of the Christian, and therefore of the world. He said that there would be two things going on, as predicted in the third secret, a crisis in the faith and a threat to the whole world. And I mentioned yesterday the apparitions of Our Lady of Akita 
in Japan who spoke of two things, a crisis in the faith and a threat to the whole world. And I mentioned yesterday that Cardinal Ratzinger said to Howard D., the ambassador to the Philippines, that Akita and Fatima are essentially the same message. And yet, in the first two parts of the Fatima message, we see nothing of dangers to the faith. Nor do we see any reference to fire raining down from the heaven and destroying a greater part of humanity, referred to in Akita, which Cardinal Ratzinger links to the message of Fatima. We also know from Cardinal Ratzinger that this text has been withheld because it might cause disequilibrium in the church and that it will not be revealed until, until such time as it can be an aid to the faith. Well, the vision revealed in 2000 is not causing any disequilibrium in the church. No one really knows exactly what it means. There must be some content that would be so disturbing and so explosive that the faithful would not be able to accept or understand it, or it would cause perhaps panic among the faithful. And there are many other testimonies. I don't have time to go into all of them. But we know that Sister Lucy herself linked the message of Fatima to the book of the Apocalypse. When asked once what the message pertained to, she said, it's in the Gospel, and it's in the Apocalypse. Read them. And we know, as I've just told you, that Pope John Paul II linked the message, the part we haven't received apparently, to the book of the Apocalypse. And we also know that at Fulda, Germany, in 1982, the Pope gave a talk that was transcribed word for word by a priest and reported in a reliable magazine in which he told a group of German intellectuals who asked about the third secret that it, and I'm quoting, it should be sufficient for all Christians to know this. If there is a message in which it is written that the oceans will flood whole areas of the earth and that from one moment to the next millions of people will perish, truly the publication of such a message is no longer something so much to be desired. And he went on to talk about how there would be trials in the church, that the church would suffer and we must be prepared to suffer martyrdom. So at Fulda, in 1982, John Paul II said, the third secret of Fatima relates to a crisis in the faith and a threat to the whole world. And the inundation of nations, the loss of millions of souls, how does that relate to Akita, fire raining down from the heavens? There's one logical explanation. It's even in the movies. If a massive object comes down from the sky like an asteroid or a comet and strikes an ocean, which has happened to this earth before, there will be massive flooding of entire continents after fire rain downs from the heavens. And in the book of the Apocalypse, what do we see? A flaming mountain, go read it, descends from heaven into the seas and poisons the waters of the world and many die. It's in the book of the Apocalypse. Am I saying that's what's going to happen? I don't know. Does it seem probable in light of the prophecy of Our Lady of Akita, which the Cardinal says is essentially the same as the message of Fatima? It seems probable to me. And since it's happened before, since the earth has been nearly destroyed that way in the past, we'd be well advised to think prudently that this could be about to happen to us or that it will happen at some time in the future. So, that brings us to the year 2000, when the Vatican published this vision. Now, here we have to focus on the role of then Archbishop Bertone, who is now Cardinal Bertone, the Vatican Secretary of State. Back then, he was the secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Now, at that time, the Vatican was confronted in 2000 by the following things. There was this etc that everyone knew was the beginning of the third secret. There were words of the Virgin. Everyone knew there were words in the third secret that she spoke. The Vatican itself referred to words of the Virgin in 1960. Everyone knew from the time of Pius XII in 1931 all the way through 2000 
that these words must refer to a crisis of faith and even apocalyptic events for the world at large. And so in 2000, in large measure because of the pressure brought to bear by Father Gruner's apostolate and millions of faithful around the world, the Vatican finally published the vision of the bishop in white. But confronted with these things that I've just mentioned, the Vatican published nothing that contains a reference to those things. The vision says nothing about what follows, the etc. The vision contains no words of the Virgin. The vision says nothing about a crisis of faith in the church. In fact, the vision says nothing at all by way of words from the Virgin. The Virgin is silent. Now, faithful around the world immediately said, this can't be all there is to the third secret. Mother Angelica, within about a year of the publication of the vision, said on television, live television, before millions of people, and I'm quoting, I happen to be one of those people who thinks we didn't get the whole thing. This is a very loyal nun, totally loyal to the Pope, totally loyal to the Vatican, and yet she casually says on national television, we didn't get the whole thing. Because millions of people believed, as she believed, that this vision cannot be the entirety of the third secret. First of all, how could the Virgin have left us a vision so ambiguous that Archbishop Bertone and Cardinal Sodano had to interpret it for us? It's inconceivable, because as you know, when the seers saw hell, she immediately explained to them what they had seen, even though it was obvious that they had seen hell. They could see the souls burning and being tossed about in hell, like coals flying about, Sister Lucy said. And yet immediately the virgin said, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. She told them what they had just seen. And yet we were asked to believe in 2000 that the virgin had absolutely nothing to say about how a pope comes to be executed by a band of soldiers outside a blasted city full of bodies. Nothing to say about that. We're supposed to figure that out for ourselves. Nobody really believed that. Something clearly was missing. But the Vatican put out an official interpretation called The Message of Fatima. It's a booklet published in 2000 that goes along with the text of the vision. And in this booklet, apparently the Vatican decided that it was going to follow an interpretation of the vision prescribed not by the Pope, not even by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, but by the Vatican Secretary of State at the time, Cardinal Sodano. The message of Fatima says four different times that it is going to follow the interpretation of Cardinal Sodano. And Cardinal Sodano claimed in this booklet that the vision of the bishop in white is all about the persecution of the church in the 20th century and that it culminates in the 1981 assassination attempt. Now let's think about that for a moment. Put aside the assassination attempt and ask yourself this question. If the vision is all about events in the 20th century, World War II, the persecution of the church by communism and Nazism, then what the Cardinal was claiming in 2000 is that the second secret is the same as the third secret, and the third secret is the same as the second secret. They both talk about the same things, and so there really is no third secret. Now, if there really is no third secret, if the third secret, according to Cardinal Sodano, is really just a vision of the second secret, then why was Sister Lucy unable to write it down? And why didn't she provide the vision immediately instead of waiting until 1944? And if the second secret and the third secret are the same, why was there any talk of a third secret of Fatima? And if the vision relates to events that had already happened for, for the most part before 2000, 
Why had the Vatican kept it secret since 1960? What was so explosive about this document that it couldn't be revealed if, as the Cardinal claimed in 2000, it was about events that had already happened? It simply doesn't make any sense. Now, let's look at the claim that the secret, the vision, relates to the assassination attempt. Nobody believed that for a moment. It's absurd. Because the Cardinal was claiming that a vision of a pope being executed, as Susta Lucy explains in her understanding of the vision reported as part of this text, the pope is killed by a band of soldiers who fire bullets and arrows at him. How can this vision of a pope being killed by bullets and arrows on a hill outside of a ruined city have anything to do with John Paul II not being killed in 1981 by a single assassin who was captured and brought to justice? And it has to be said that the pope, thank God, recovered from his wounds and went on to live a very active life. He returned to the ski slopes. He used his pool at Castel Gandolfo. He did not die for 25 years after 1981. So for the cardinal to say that the fallen pope in the vision who dies is the pope who returns to the ski slope and lives another 25 years is ludicrous. No one believed it. Not even the secular press believed it. And yet in the message of Fatima, again and again we're told that the vision of the bishop in white and the whole message of Fatima, and this is the key phrase used over and over again, belongs to the past. They wanted us all to think in the year 2000, the message of Fatima was over and done with. It's all in the past. Russia has been consecrated. The pope has escaped death. And Fatima is over and done with. Everybody go back to sleep now. We can forget about Fatima. Meanwhile, of course, the world continues to get worse and worse and worse. Immorality is spreading through every nation. We've had millions upon millions of abortions. There are wars everywhere. And we're told that Fatima has nothing to say about any of this. Nothing to say to the church in the present times. Nothing to say by way of warning that the world is heading for disaster. Oh no, it's all in the past as of the year 2000. And again, who really believed that? Did anybody really believe that? I've talked to many priests, forget Mother Angelica, talk about the rank and file faithful, the priests I've met, even bishops I've met. It's just assumed that we haven't been given the whole thing, just as Mother Angelica says. And then we had a breakthrough. The little group of traditionalists and Fatimists, they kept talking about this, and Father Gruner kept speaking the truth that people knew or people suspected. And they were, they were denounced as Fatimists and extreme traditionalists and ridiculed and made fun of just the way they were when they said that Paul VI had never prohibited the traditional mass. They were right all along, but they were laughed at all along. And they were laughed at when it concerned this. But then there was a breakthrough. In November of 2006, Antonio Sochi, a major celebrity in Italy, a very serious Catholic, the host of a television show, and the personal acquaintance of Pope Benedict XVI and Cardinal Bertone, published a book. And what Sochi said was, he was on the side of all of those who were making fun of the Fatimists. He thought that in 2000, the Vatican had revealed everything and that the Fatimists were just a bunch of cuckoos who were promoting a crazy conspiracy theory. But then he began to look at the evidence. And Sochi is an honest man. And he said, in the end, I had to surrender. The evidence was overwhelming. The vision of the bishop in white could not possibly be the entirety of the third secret. He said in the introduction to his book, I reached a conclusion that was the opposite of what I had started out with. He wanted to destroy the Fatimists and show that they were making things up. And he ended up being convinced by the evidence that they were absolutely right. And so he became a Fatimist. 
Not only that, he mastered the entire subject, and he came up with things, including a hypothesis that I will get to at the end of this talk that puts this whole thing into perspective. But he did something else very important. Aside from presenting the evidence that I've outlined here very briefly, and there's a lot more to it, but I, I can't get to it all, he brought forward to the world the testimony of Archbishop Capovilla, with which I began this speech. The testimony uncovered by Solideo Paolini, who's going to address you at this conference. And he showed to the world what Solideo had brought to his attention. And he showed that during a telephone conversation with Archbishop Capovilla, he was discussing these, this document in which the Archbishop had noted back in the 60s that Paul VI had read a text of the secret in 1963, not 1965, as the Vatican had said in 2000. And that there was an apparent discrepancy. He asked the Archbishop, how could there be two different dates? Is this a mistake? And finally, during this conversation, the Archbishop admitted to him that there were two different envelopes the Capovilla envelope, and the Bertone envelope. The Bertone envelope obviously contains the vision of the bishop in white. And the Capovilla envelope is the one that was in Barbarigo, the writing desk. And so Solideo, as he will tell you in more detail, asked him, are you saying then that there were two different texts of the third secret of Fatima? And Archbishop Capovilla replied, per la punto. Exactly so. And, and Antonio Sochi published that testimony and that answer to the entire world, and to this day, the Vatican has not denied it. But what happened was, Archbishop Bertone wrote a book, and this is quite amazing. He's now the Vatican Secretary of State. He writes a book to answer Antonio Sochi. In this book, which is entitled L'ultima vegente di Fatima, the last Fatima visionary, he pretends to answer Sochi. And I say pretends to answer because as Sochi pointed out on his website and elsewhere, there is not a single answer in this book to any of the points I've raised. First of all, in this, some, I think it's a 187 page book, he never addresses the testimony of Archbishop Capovilla. That in itself concedes the entire case. Here is a witness who says there are two texts of the secret. One of them is in the papal apartment. The interviewer who worked with Cardinal Bertone brings this claim to his attention in the questions that are in Cardinal Bertone's book, and Cardinal Bertone refuses to answer the question. He won't even discuss the testimony of Archbishop Capovilla. Now imagine you're the subject of a criminal investigation. Someone comes to your house to interview you, and he says, your next door neighbor claims that you went into his house and stole jewelry from his safe and brought it over to your house and hid the jewelry in your house. What do you say to the testimony of that witness against you? And your answer is, would you like a cup of coffee? Isn't it a nice day? Why don't we go for a walk in the park? I have a very important engagement now. I have to leave. And that's the end of your interview. You never mention the testimony of your next-door neighbor. Wouldn't it be reasonable to conclude that you agree that the next-door neighbor has spoken the truth? If he was going to write a book to answer Sochi, the first thing he had to do was address the testimony of Archbishop Capovilla. He refuses to do so. Therefore, he concedes that the witness has spoken the truth. He also ignores in his book the specific testimony that there's a text in the papal apartment. This is brought to his attention by the interviewer in the book. And his answer is something like, how can they be so sure that the text always remained in the papal apartment? Notice, he's not denying there's a text in the papal apartment. He tries to shift our attention away from that to another issue, whether it was always in the papal apartment. What does that mean? 
He's basically admitting there was a text there. And now he's saying, well, how do they know it wasn't always, or rather, how do they know it was always there? Well, he would know whether it was always there. All he would have to do is ask. Was there a text in the papal department? Was it always there? He could have asked John Paul II while the Pope was still alive. He could have asked Cardinal Ratzinger, who certainly knew and knows what's in the papal department. He could have asked Archbishop Dejevich, the Pope's beloved personal secretary, was there a text in the papal department? He could have asked any number of people whether there was a text in the papal department. Why didn't he ask anybody? Either he did and didn't like the answer, or he didn't ask because he doesn't want to know the answer. In any event, he concedes there was a text in the papal department. He also ignores the etc. The interviewer specifically brings to his attention this etc. And he specifically tells Bertone that the Fatimites, the Fatimists, the traditionalists are saying that this etc contains missing words of the Virgin. And what does the Archbishop, now Cardinal Bertone, say about this? He says it's a hashed and rehashed hypothesis. But he doesn't deny it. He doesn't really address it at all. He knows it's an issue. He doesn't answer some simple questions. Did you ask Sister Lucy when you claim you interviewed her? He says he's conducted three interviews of Sister Lucy. Did you ask her about the etc.? Apparently not, because Sochi in his book says, why did Archbishop Bertone, now Cardinal Bertone, not ask Sister Lucy? What follows the, the word etc.? Where are the missing words of the Virgin? Why does he not want to know about the etc.? And by the way, why does the Vatican, in the message of Fatima, not use the fourth memoir where the etc. appears. Why does the Vatican use the third memoir where Sister Lucy had not yet added the phrase in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc.? Why does the Vatican use the third memoir and not the fourth memoir? Why does the Vatican say in a footnote, oh yes, by the way, there is a fourth memoir, and Sister Lucy added a notation about Portugal and etc.? No, it was not Sister Lucy's notation. Those were the words of the Virgin Mary herself. And yet the Vatican claimed in 2000 that was simply a note by Sister Lucy. And Sochi asks in his book, how could they dare claim those words of the Virgin about Portugal and etc. were Sister Lucy's notation when obviously they were the words of the Virgin. And why won't... Cardinal Bertone talk about the etc., even though it's presented to him as an issue. Why does he continue to ignore it? Why does he continue to ignore the testimony of Monsignor or Father Schweigel that I mentioned earlier, that there are two parts to the secret? One part concerns the Pope, and the other is a logical continuation of the words following the etc. Why does he ignore that? Why does he ignore every single claim of the Fatimists, as he calls them, in his book. Why does he answer Sochi without answering him? Sochi says this on his website. The cardinal never answered me. He did not answer a single question in this 187-page book. Now, if accusations are made against you and you answer them in 187 pages, which contain no answer, you have admitted the accusations because you had the chance to answer them and failed to do so. You went on for 187 pages and said nothing. And there's another point I'd like to cover. I told you earlier that John Paul II read a text of the Third Secret in 1978. His own spokesman, Navarro Valls, admitted that to the press. And in his book, L'Ultima Vigente di Fatima, the interviewer is asked, asks Cardinal Bertone, what about it? Did John Paul II read a text of the secret in 1978? And here is what the cardinal said. In my opinion, no. What do you mean, in my opinion? All the cardinal had to do was ask Navarro Valls. Excuse me, 
did the Pope read a text of the secret in 1978? All the Cardinal had to do was ask John Paul II while he was still alive. Holy Father, did you read a text of the secret in 1978? All the Cardinal had to do was ask Monsignor Dejevich, who's still alive, he's now the Archbishop of Krakow, did the Pope read a text of the secret in 1978? All the Cardinal had to do was ask any one of a hundred people who would know, did the Pope read a text of the secret in 1978? And his answer to that question, in his own book, in my opinion, no. In other words, he never asked because he did not want to know the answer. Or he did ask and doesn't want to tell us the answer. Now, why is he so concerned about not addressing whether the Pope read a text of the secret in 1978? I will tell you why. If the Pope read a text of the secret in 1978, the entire official account of the Vatican collapses because the Vatican says that he read a text of the secret in 1981 and that that text was returned to the Holy Office archives. But there is no record of any text being taken from the Holy Office archives in 1978. So if the Pope read a text in 1978, it did not come from the Holy Office archives and did not go back to the Holy Office archives. Where did it come from? And where did it go back to? The papal apartment, which dovetails with the testimony of Archbishop Capovilla that there's a text in the papal apartment, which testimony Cardinal Bertone refuses to address. He pretends Archbishop Capovilla doesn't exist because he doesn't want to address that testimony. Now, after the book was published by Cardinal Bertone, and Sochi said, you haven't answered me, I have to be frank, Cardinal Bertone became a bit of a laughingstock, because Sochi said that book is a disaster for him and for the Vatican. There were many accusations against the Vatican. You had a chance to answer them. Instead of answering them, you ran away from all the questions and never answered a single one. And now you have a problem because now more people than ever don't believe you. And so she said, I'm not happy about that because I'm a Catholic first before I'm a journalist. I don't want the Vatican to look bad. I would rather be wrong, he said. I would rather that Cardinal Bertoni had demolished my whole case in his book. But instead, he answered nothing, and now everyone knows the Vatican must be hiding something. So what happened next? The Secretary of State of the Vatican goes on television to try again to answer Sochi. And we know that he went on TV to answer Sochi because the name of the show was Il Quarto Segreto di Fatima Non Esiste. Non esiste il quarto segreto di Fatima. The fourth secret of Fatima does not exist. So the whole show was about the title of Sochi's book, which I think I forgot to mention. The title of Sochi's book was Il Quarto Segreto. Sochi said there's a fourth secret of Fatima. It's the missing text. So he goes on TV to address the fourth secret, to try to prove that it doesn't exist. Now who's on this TV show? We have Cardinal Bertone sitting in a fancy chair in the Vatican, and he's coming onto the show, which is the show Porta a Porta, the most popular talk show in Italy. It's like the Phil Donahue show in America. Everybody watches Porta a Porta. He's on camera from the Vatican, and the former prime minister of Italy, Andriotti, is there, and a lady journalist is there, and Marco Politi is there, and the host, Mr. Vespa, is there. And they're all there to talk about Antonio Sochi's book. And who isn't there? Antonio Sochi. They don't invite Sochi onto the show to talk about Sochi's book. They all want to attack Sochi's book without Sochi being there. And as Sochi said, they, they gave themselves an empty goal to kick the soccer ball into. And what happened during that show? Sochi tells us on his website. 
or Cardinal Bertone, scores a goal against himself on this TV show. What's the first thing that happens? Well, they're all there to talk about Sochi's book. And the big thing that Sochi introduces is the testimony of Archbishop Capovilla. Capovilla says, hello, there are two texts. I'm telling you now, there are two texts. One is in the papal apartment in the wooden desk drawer, the desk called Barbarigo, and the other is in the Holy Office archives. I'm alive, I'm well, I'm telling you this. The whole world knows it. And here's Cardinal Bertone and four guests, and what do they talk about concerning Capovilla? Nothing. They never mention Archbishop Capovilla, even once during the entire TV show. Incredible, but that's what happens. So they've given away the case. The witness has spoken against them. They go on television. They never mention the witness. Obviously, the witness is telling the truth. That's why they won't talk about him. And it's also obvious that there must have been an agreement among everybody on that show that they would not embarrass the cardinal by mentioning this witness who blows the cardinal's story into pieces. Not a single mention of Archbishop Capovilla. The text in the papal apartment. Everyone knows now there's a text in the papal apartment. Not a single reference to the papal apartment during the entire broadcast. During the broadcast, they mention Ottaviani's testimony, that there are 20 to 25 lines in this text, whereas the vision of the bishop in white is 62 lines. Even Cardinal Bertone says, yes, I understand that he said unequivocally, the cardinal, that there are 25 lines in the text. He admits that the cardinal said that. And his answer? He has no answer. He doesn't deny that the cardinal said there are 20 to 25 lines of text. He tries to explain it away by holding up a text on camera, and I'll get to that in a minute, to try to come up with 25 lines out of 62. He doesn't succeed. Now, I've been talking about two envelopes throughout this speech. 50 minutes into the broadcast, Archbishop, now Cardinal Bertone, produces the envelope. Allora, la busta, says the host. And so he pulls out this big envelope. And he takes out of the big envelope, which was sealed by the Bishop of Fatima, a smaller envelope, which is not sealed. And on that envelope, according to the cardinal, Sister Lucy had written the name of the Bishop of Fatima. And he says, well, that envelope is not sealed because it was inside the first one, which was sealed. So we have one envelope from Sister Lucy. He opens that envelope. He takes out a third envelope. That one is sealed, and the seals have been broken. And on the outside of that envelope, he holds it up to the camera. What do we see? By express order, she wrote on the envelope, by express order of the Blessed Virgin, this envelope can only be opened in 1960 by the Bishop of Fatima or the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon. Let's go back to 2000. In 2000, Cardinal Bertone said he interviewed Sister Lucy and she told him that the Virgin had never given her any order about the secret not being opened in 1960. That was just a date she picked herself, Cardinal Bertone claimed in 2000. And now seven years later, he produces an envelope on camera saying, by express order of the Virgin, this can only be opened in 1960. Already we know there's a major contradiction. Then he pulls out a second envelope inside this one, another sealed envelope which has exactly the same thing on the outside. By express order of the Blessed Virgin Mary, this envelope can be opened only in 1960 by the Bishop of Fatima or the Cardinal Patriarch of Lisbon. So now we have, lo and behold, two envelopes with identical warnings. This can be opened in 1960, and this can be opened only in 1960. Just as Archbishop Capovilla said, there were two different envelopes. And Cardinal Bertoni was now asking us to believe that Sister Lucy simply put one inside the other. But ask yourselves, would you put 
on an outside of an envelope. This can be opened in 1960. Seal it. And then put it inside another envelope and put on that one. This can be opened in 1960 and seal that one. I don't think Sister Lucy had obsessive compulsive disorder. I think she had two envelopes because there were two different texts. And Archbishop Capovilla said so. And Cardinal Bertoni on television finally revealed it to the world. And he had to show us those two envelopes because everybody now knows there are two envelopes. What is he going to do? If he doesn't show both envelopes right now, it will never go away. So he did show us both envelopes. He just put one inside the other. That's my theory. It's the only possible explanation. Well, it makes no sense that you would create two different sealed envelopes with two different warnings for one document. So let me conclude by asking a question. There's so much more I could get into. It would take three or four hours just to give you an outline. Am I saying that Archbishop, now Cardinal Bertone, is a liar? Is he just lying about this? Sochi doesn't think so. And I would propose to you this. You don't have to conclude that there's deliberate lying. What Sochi says is this. He says there's a mental reservation going on. They decided back in 2000 that they would reveal the vision of the bishop in white, but they would hold back the text, and they would let the pope speak about that text in his sermon at Fatima in May of 2000, when he says that the, the vision, that the message of Fatima is a warning about the tail of the dragon sweeping the stars from heaven, meaning priests and religious. And we should be wary, we should be aware, we should be afraid of, we should avoid the tail of the dragon. That reference makes no sense in relation to the first two parts, but it makes perfect sense in relation to the missing text. So, so she concludes that they made a bargain with the Pope. Holy Father, we can't reveal the whole thing. Let's reveal the vision. You talk about the text in your sermon, and people will sort of get the idea that it's about Book 12, chapters 3 and 4 of the Apocalypse. And we've concluded, your Holy Father, that this text that she wrote down, this one-page text, with these terrible things in it, it's really not authentic. We can't really verify it. And John the 23rd said much the same thing according to Capovilla. I don't really know if it's supernatural. So we really can't say it's authentic. And so we'll treat it as if it doesn't exist. And so when we say we've given the whole text of the message of Fatima, we mean the authentic text. And, you'll, and if you look at the TV show, which is still available online, he speaks repeatedly, the cardinal, of the authentic text. And he says, very tellingly, we had a meeting in 2000 and we decided to reveal, listen carefully to this, everything that actually existed in the Holy Office archive. Now, why would he say everything that actually existed in the Holy Office archive instead of simply saying we decided to reveal the whole third secret? He knows there's a text in the papal department, yet he talks about what they revealed in the papal archive. He's making a mental distinction between what he now considers the authentic text in the archive, and he calls it that, the authentic text in the papal archive, and what they now claim, at least in their minds, is the inauthentic, the not authentic text in the papal department. And that's why he won't talk about the text that the Pope read in 1978. That's why he won't talk about the text referred to by Archbishop Capovilla. That's why he's pretending that text does not exist, because the official version in their minds is it's not authentic. So we're not lying if we say we've given you the authentic text in the papal archives, because we have given you that, and that's all we're giving you, because in our, in our view, that's all that's authentic. And so it's a mental reservation. And yet he went on the radio in June and he made this curious statement. He said, I am firmly convinced that there isn't anything else to the secret. That is astounding. How could he say, I'm firmly convinced? Is this now a matter of opinion? Is he suggesting to us, in case it comes out later on, well, there might be something else that some people will claim later is the rest of the third secret, but I'm firmly convinced that there's nothing else. He wouldn't be firmly convinced if he knew for a fact that there's nothing else. He would simply say, there is nothing else. 
He's leaving some room for himself by saying that on the radio only this past June. So where does that leave us? Well, basically, we already know the third secret. It's clear enough from the testimony I've outlined. But the problem is not everyone knows it. Many people are in the dark, and they have an obligation to find out, and the Vatican has a duty to tell them what's in this secret. Because as Sochi points out in his book, these are the words of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They are a warning from heaven itself. And it must be a warning of things so terrible that the result of ignoring the warning will be the loss of millions of souls for all eternity and the destruction of a greater part of humanity. How dare anyone, no matter how high is authority in the church, keep those words from us, hide them in a safe in the papal apartment, and take the position that they're not authentic. At the very least, they should reveal those words and tell us why they think they're not authentic. But they won't even do that. So I would say to you, in conjunction with what I said yesterday, just as you should go back to your dioceses and start a movement throughout the church for the consecration of Russia, start a movement in your diocese for the revelation of the entirety of the third secret. Because as Frere Michel said in 1984, the consecration of Russia, in his opinion, won't happen until the insult to God involved in the censorship of the third secret is redressed. And the only way to redress that censorship is to reveal the rest of the secret. And so, just as the fate of the world and the church in this time is bound up in, in the consecration of Russia, the consecration of Russia is bound up in the full and complete revelation of the third secret of Fatima. I implore you to go back to your diocese and carry forward with what Sochi has so courageously done in Italy, and what Solideo Paolini has done in Italy, and with what Father Gruner has done in Canada and throughout the world with his apostolate. Be apostles for the consecration of Russia and for the revelation of the third secret of Fatima, for the good of the church and the good of the whole world. Thank you.